I'm 62. I've been at it since 94. A lot of people have worked for us and with us. Ultimately, leadership and ownership is visible and vulnerable. And that's true in any context. They know all your warts and blemishes and failures and all your successes and goodness. And that is the truth. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Design Development, your hub to learn direct from top performers in real estate development, design, and construction. I'm your host, Renz Hayes, founding partner of H&O, lifelong learner, and I am personally obsessed with high-powered organizations and the leaders that guide them. If this is your first time listening, thank you so much for tuning in, and if you're a returning listener, welcome back. Let's go. It is my pleasure to introduce today's guest, John Wheaton. He is a founding partner of Wheaton Sprague Building Envelope. They are building engineers and consultants to all types of building facades. They're out of Ohio, but they service projects nationally. They work on high rise. Something that I love about John is he truly understands culture and in organization building. He's a great team leader. He really invests in his team. Is it the architect's responsibility? Is it the consultant's responsibility? Does it go on the contractor? Like, How do you mitigate risk in a building envelope and clarify who's responsible for what? So without further ado, let's get to my conversation with John Wheat. Please join me in welcoming John to Design Development. John, thank you so much for joining us today. Great to be here. I'm super excited about it. Great to be here. I- we we met on the PSMJ Executive Forum, and I just kept finding every time we were both, um, I, let's call us frequent contributors, and every time I heard you speak up on answering a business question, an organization question, a culture, I just found myself agreeing with you and seeing things very aligned, and we collaborated there. Then you're active on LinkedIn, you launched a podcast, and, and through all that, we kind of built a relationship. Um, so I, I, for one, am grateful for those platforms to bring guys like us together. Where in the country are you, John? Northeast Ohio between Cleveland and Akron. Northeast Ohio. I'm in Boston, Mass. Haven't really traveled around much. And we got to meet literally through these types of platforms. I think that's great. Um, it is. For, for those that are unfamiliar with you, John, could you tell us a little bit about you and your company and what you're up to today? Yeah, so personally, I was born in Illinois. I grew up eight years in the Chicago suburbs, moved to Ohio in 1968 with my parents. I've been here ever since. Lived on a 60-acre farm um, for four years my, while my dad worked at TRW in Minerva, Ohio. He's a metallurgical engineer. And then we moved to a, a smaller place, about four acres, where I went to junior high and high school, graduated from West Yaga High School. Been in Northeast Ohio for a long time. It's actually known as the Western Reserve. It's a little bit more New Englandy than it is anything else, at least in this area of Ohio. The Western Reserve. I've never heard of that. I like it. Yeah, it's actually settled by Connecticut settlers, and all the towns have clock towers and town squares and churches. And it looks like, like go to Glastonbury, Connecticut, or a town in Massachusetts, and you'll go, oh, this looks really similar. Anyway, that's too funny. Um, yeah, so. I uh, had a good upbringing, went to University of Akron, graduated with a stellar 2.74 grade point average in civil engineering. Um, ah, that's a good story right there. Yeah, and I have a lot to say about that. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm married, three kids, a couple grandkids, and I'm currently CEO of Wheaton and Sprague Engineering, also known as Wheaton Sprague Building Envelope. And um, I have a specific responsibilities for the company we can talk more about. So yeah. that's a little bit I about get me. there in a second. You had some gems right there. So let's dive into the formal education. I, I personally believe formal education is going to change significantly over the next five to 10 years. I think you're going to see a lot of private universities go out of business. I think the push for advanced education, like maybe beyond the bachelors, a lot less people will get bachelors. Tell us what are your thoughts on, on formal education? And like, obviously yeah, I think very highly of you as a leader in a business and you, you talk about the GPA. What are your thoughts on all this? Well, my first comment is grade point average is not the sole indicator of the success or failure um, predictability of a candidate when you hire them. In fact, um, I, I don't want to say this carte blanche, but my experience has actually been otherwise that engineers that have struggled and worked and co-opted and maintained an, a grade point average, um, not at 4.0. I, I, I've 
they've tended to be more well-rounded, but that's not to put any disparaging comments on the really smart because I don't want to sound like, well, I only had a 2.74. There's some guys in my class that were 3.538 and they're brilliant and they're great leaders in their areas. I just think it's about the well-roundedness of the individual or their background. I know you, you, you worked in an area with hands-on stuff as well yes. with, and you have an engineering degree. So I think grade point itself isn't the sole indicator. Um, it, again, it depends on the firm and whether you're a firm of journeymen, journeywomen who are really just applicators or whether you're more of a research think tank. It, uh, there's a lot of things there. Um, I just was one who was better. I was better in languages in writing than I was in math from an SAT, ACT point of view. But because I didn't know how else you made money because my dad was an engineer. I went engineering and because I was really fascinated by it. But to answer your question about formal education, I think the general the general formal educations. Oh, gosh. So if you want to be a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant or an engineer or a nurse practitioner, you've got to have the certificate. You've got to have. I look at us as the mm -hmm. white collar version of trades. We're just, our toolbox is software and other skills. And we combine with with the other hands-on folks to, to try to make the world work together. And one's no more or less important than the other. But if, but from an entrepreneurship side or learning business in general or liberal arts, I think there's significant changes there. I mean, again, those educations are valuable. I think the campus experience can be valuable but you certainly don't have to go to school anymore to be an, a technically savvy person, let's say. You may not get a professional engineering certificate without an ABET accredited or, or an NCARB without an architect accredited. But, I mean, you can learn physics and math and science online as well as read from a liberal arts perspective. So I do think the best universities will adapt and – the lowest levels, if they don't adapt, they're going to go down. There's definitely a re, let's say there's a, a newfound awareness to the return on investment of a bachelor's degree. Like yeah. the, in the previous generations, it's called it the last 10 or 20 years. There's been a societal emphasis on like, oh, you got to go to college and this is what college costs. You just take on debt, like you can get the debt to go to college, but there isn't necessarily, there's not a guaranteed return on it. So it, you take an example of sales, like sales is a great career. Like, are you going to go to four years of college and take on a hundred thousand dollars of debt, $60,000 of debt, maybe more than both of those? Or like, are you, could you live at home, work for free, work for a small wage, be fully compensated on your production as a salesperson and get reps right out of the gate. And if you look at person A versus person B in four years, I'm guessing the person that's been working for four years isn't going to be in debt and they're going to have a lot of skills, right? Yeah. I, I think the point is, <clears throat> are you an educated person or shall I say, are you a person who can self-educate? Are you committed to learning? I don't care who you are or what your background 100%. is. Like, I mean, I if if I was, I like to work with my hands and I like to apply things. I I would seriously consider being a in the IBEW or Plumbers Union or something like that because I don't care what your track is. Success success lies in how much you invest in it and how willing you are to take risk and how much you are willing to learn. And to your point, you're 18 years old, you know, you want to get in sales, you know, there's a lot of tracks you can take. I think the one of the big values of college still is the people you meet and the types of people you meet who are going in a similar direction. But again, you can still find that in online communities now. So the education thing, I think the jury's still out about all the forms and functions. To your point, people are much more conscious of the ROI now. It's not, I've either got to do this or I've got to do that. There's a lot of forms to it. There's a lot of forms to it. That was, I, that was a sidetrack from our, our conversation, but I think it's an important one. So I'm happy we got that in there. 
Um, let's go into Wheaton Sprague building envelope. So talk to us about what exactly do you do as building envelope consultants and, and what markets do you serve? Where are you focused? So Wheaton Sprague building envelope. Well, we are, I like to say we're a niche business. So we're an inch wide and a mile deep. In other words, we're vertigrated. We do design, engineering, science, and consulting for building enclosures, building facades, and we have two divisions. So where we started, the division we started, which is the oldest part of the business, is the building envelope engineering di division. And that is in, in the vernacular delegated design professionals. So we provide structural engineering, thermal analysis, system design, shop drawings, product development, fabrication drawings, and all the related things primarily for glazing and specialty trade subcontractors, panel, glass, stone, etc. cetera. Um, we also uh, do some miscellaneous work in that group, some specialty structural engineering and things like that. We also do some work for some high-end architectural fabricators, panel and, and uh, glazed aluminum fabricator uh, clients. It's probably 85% subcontractors, 15% uh, custom fabricators. And then uh, we have a building envelope consulting division. And in that division, we provide the totality of envelope consulting services, not just glass and glazing, it's it's masonry and panel and, you know, stone, um, brick, punched opening, uh, residential and commercial, some roofing, waterproofing, um, and all the traditional things. Some define now as uh, commissioning, but it's it's traditional curtain wall consulting, and you know we we serve primarily the design, construction, and forensic community there. So, like when I say vertically integrated, like a horizontally integrated company to me is a company that does forensic engineering, and they do transportation, building, infrastructure. They do everything, but their thing is forensics. We're vertically integrated. We do building envelope design, engineering, consulting. And we deliver it in various forms to various clients, but that's all we do is the building envelope side of things. Yeah, that, I, that's an interesting distinguish way to distinguish it. So you, you focus on the building envelope, but you really support it from conception and feasibility through design and then also supporting the contractor through that other. Yeah, and it de yeah, it depends on the division. We don't ever mix the two, so we don't ever consult on something where the delegated design professor completely like right now I'm the director of building envelope consulting and another person is the director of building envelope engineering both under my partner. Um but yeah, so like in that vertical space we do some forensics, we do design support, we do construction administration. Um, troubleshooting, um, and then on again on that other the delegated design space, panel, glass, stone, canopy, sunshades, engineering, thermal analysis, whatever. But it's it's all to deliver to somebody in that category. All right, and then so on the consulting side, your clients are you generally working direct for let's say an existing building owner, or are you coming in through an architect and a design team for new development? Where does your your breadth of work lie on existing and new? So in the three, in, again, from a big picture point of view, in the three major categories on the design side, we're typically working to support the architect. On the, mm -hmm. on the construction side, we're typically working with the construction manager or GC. On the forensic side, it's usually a lawyer, an insurance agent, um, a building owner, a building developer, CBRE, colleague, somebody like that. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes, I mean, the common thread through all of that is the building owner or the owner's representative. They can be in any yeah, category. They're at the top of the food. Yep, they're the top, top of, of the, the food, food chain. chain more or less. I'd like to understand and help share the audience the integration of your services, say, with an architect when you're hired through them on, let's call it a new build. Where does the line of responsibility on the exterior wall construction and envelope? Are you are you address, addressing um, thermal or sustainability performance, like uh, heat and temperature retention, waterproofing, fire protection, like code compliance. So how does that blend with the responsibility of an architect? Yeah, good question. It depends on the scope of work requested, of course, and what expertise the architect has at their disposal from their own staff. 
Um, but generally, the mostly the architect is working with the owner to define, you know, the massing and shaping and what the building is going to be and look like and do. And we would get involved ideally at schematic design. They're producing drawings and outline specifications and aesthetics and in establishing the minimum performance guidelines per code. And we're coming in and we're typically reviewing and commenting on the specs and the drawings. We're providing input on fenestration types and, and performance capabilities, different options for opaque surfaces, you know, different waterproofing types and fluid applied versus stick on. And, you know, all of those things we're, we're speaking to and supporting the technical performance side of the building cladding building envelope or whatever mm -hmm. portion they're asking us to help with. Yeah, cool. And, and how do you look at the liability of a building envelope? I, I actually look at that part of a building and I think it's a, a pretty high liability area because water has a funny way of finding its way into any imperfection in an exterior surface. And that's something a lot of people are touching, right? There's some specs coming from the architect, you're owning a spec and then somebody else is building it or several contractors are contributing to all the things that go into there's manufacturer products and then there's how it's installed. So there's all different ways that something like that, something can go wrong on a building envelope. So how do you manage that liability? And is there a process to like really monitor quality control at a professional level? How do you, how do we reduce risk? And if we're able to reduce risk, we're increasing our value to the client and to the development. Well, and I imagine you're, you're, you're jumping at that. Yeah. Great question. So first of all, adding a building envelope consultant to your project statistically reduces the risk of failure and issues, period. Mm -hmm. The building enclosure is, you know, typically 25, 30, 35% of the cost of construction. And it is the defining architectural component. It is the skin. It's the, it's the element by which you recognize the building. If you and I didn't have skin on, it was just bones. It'd be like, oh, yep, there's some bones from a couple of guys. You're hiding all of our structure over here. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then let's acknowledge that the number one cause for risk claims is communication related issues. 28, 29% of all claims are caused by communication issues or the issues thereof. Then let's also acknowledge that the highest number of claims by far are on multifamily residential projects, condominiums being number one. And so yep. the first area you reduce risk, um, Let's, let's talk about it from my perspective. We have to have a go, no go list on what type of building are we willing to work on? It's far riskier to work as a delegated design engineer on a condominium project than it is as a consultant. And there's far greater value to provide as a consultant on a multifamily or condominium project than there is as a delegated design engineer. Um, then I, could, you, could you explain why? I think that's a really good takeaway for people in architecture and real estate development. So to reiterate that the, the probability of success or the reduced risk from bringing in a, a building envelope consultant on the consulting side during the design phase has, is, is far less risky than just trying to push it down to the contractor as a delegated design element. Right? Yeah, and I think, but I was talking from our perspective, if a job came to me, if, if a 10 story condominium job came to me as a delegated design engineer, we, we would still probably do it and quote it, but there's more risk mm -hmm. to that job than there is if I'm working on the consulting side. And, and there is less risk to the owner to have a building envelope consultant. And that's primarily because many of those projects have three, four, five different exterior enclosure types from three, four, five different trade subcontractors, unless your owner is really committed to an, an EWSC, an exterior wall subcontractor who's 100% responsible for all enclosure and coordinating all trades, almost like a prime sub. But do you prefer what's that? that? 
Do you suggest, do you suggest that approach? Is that the preferred approach? I would always suggest a single source exterior wall subcontractor. However, it's not always practical depending on the construction community, availability, typology, and, you know, some curtain wall contractors like, well, I'm not taking responsibility for the masonry. Well, then who takes mm -hmm. responsibility for the transition between the masonry and the unitized curtain wall or the punched opening and the stone? And that just has to be clearly defined. So that's where an envelope consultant helps. But then I think risk for us as design professionals, um, even operationally, it starts at the proposal language. What scope are we willing to take or not? Where's the value for the client? And then when we deliver a, a, a report, a deliverable good, it's using appropriate language. Like when I review a report, if I see the word best, only, um, inspection, specific, uh, those words jump right out of me, you know, the, mm -hmm. um, may cause or likely to be, you, you want to be definitive if you can be definitive, but if you can't be, you don't want to, you don't want to guess at anything. So you have to use the right language. Um, so there's a lot of layers to the risk piece of it. But yeah, the, the language you just mentioned, even in a, a proposal is really a contract, right? So it, it, there, the, that language is subjective, which means it can be argued later on to be used against you. So that's where it's important to use the right language in contract. Yeah, like never, ever say we use best practices to provide ultimate value to our client. Really? Uh, last I checked, we all use standard practice to the best of our ability to provide appropriate value to the client in whatever form is necessary or perceived. There's somebody out there that can create some level of performance that illustrates that you're not the best performer. Yeah, and your client will your client will tell you or not through repeat business whether they think you're the best standard practitioner in your category. Yes. Do you have that's some a great way to do you deliver some value that nobody else delivers? Great. But it's not best practices. Let's dive into the history of of Wheaton Sprague. When did you guys launch? We launched in February of 1994. 1994. So you guys have been two business partners yep. for 1994. That's coming up. Wow, that's 30 years. That's an impressive partnership. Um, I value partnership a lot. And I feel like I was fortunate to get some experience in working alongside partners and some mentors that had partners that worked and didn't work to like really learn and think about like, what is a partnership in business? And, and really it's almost like a second marriage. So I'd love to hear your lessons on partnership and, and what's made you two so successful together for such a long time. Yeah, that's a really good comment, Renz. Any relationship that is linked together financially, legally, domestically, is a what biblically you would define it or statutorily you would define it as a covenant relationship. So like I have two covenant mm -hmm. relationships in my wife in my life. I have my my wife and I have a a covenant relationship. And my partner and I, while we're partners, have a business covenant relationship, right? Our That's finances great. are hooked into each other, whether we like it or not. I think the number one predictor of long-term business success isn't the technical capabilities match of the partners, but the moral, cultural, personal commitment alignment. Um, yes. So like, you know, first of all, Richard and I are opposites. Like I always joke, if you put his left lobe and my right lobe in the same human, you'd have a balanced person, you know? He's, <laughs> he's, That's a good partnership. He's, he's quiet, internal, detailed, operational, um, focused more on managing. I'm verbal, passionate, visible, external, focused on growth. And it took us too long to figure out, um, you know, Probably the biggest failure on my part was being too involved in too many things for too long because I I know the business inside and out at every level, upside, inside out. Um, 
at, at least, or thought I did. And um, so another whole storyline, it probably we could dive down if you want, but is, is when we implemented entrepreneurial operating system and 100%. Yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, we started in 94. Um, he and I are both uh, Christian men in terms like we're, we're committed to following and um, in, in all our fractured state, anybody listening that has worked for me used to work with me. Oh yeah, sure. But you know, in, in Jesus is important to us and, um, and the commitment to biblical principles, again, in all our fracturedness, it's not about us, it's about him, but we're both committed to that cause and mission and to those standards of being, having as much integrity around that as we can. So that's important. Um, and honestly, we didn't know anything when we started. So, I mean, we just, he could draw and design and I could engineer and sell and we just started, you know. And you just went for it. We just, what do you? If you could think back to the time that you did start, like, why did you launch? Was it because you saw this opportunity? Were you frustrated in the opportunities that were presenting themselves in your career? Like what made you de-risk and, and go for this? Yeah, so um, I was the staff engineer, um, PE at MK Architectural Metal. Great place, loved the work. We did custom architectural cladding systems there, glaze systems, stick and unitized. Mm -hmm. But things were slowing down in 94. Um, I was getting capped out there as a design professional. I realized I was going to be stuck at a professional engineer level there, or at least at that time, I couldn't envision myself doing anything else. Um, and I thought professional services would be a, a better place to apply my craft. Also, I went to two or three local firms and peddled the idea of stepping in because I was like, yeah, it'd be kind of tough right now. You've got two little kids and, you know, we've got one on the way. And they were like, sounds interesting, but that's not for us. Have at it. And so I also had been doing more and more work on the side and seeing a niche where if I, when I delivered the structural engineering piece at the time, um, the way I delivered it, it really got traction with customers. So I, I felt like we we had an audience and that we could get work. I'm honest, I'd... that's it. I, I mean, you you you. But doing side work, thinking of opportunities, talking to other firms, you're you're weighing your options. And at the end of the day, you were doing enough to see the opportunity yeah. that gave you the confidence but to go for. My it. wife, who's probably the wisest voice in my life, not probably she is the wisest voice in my life. She's ex not right ninety nine point nine percent of the time. She said to me. If if this is the option, if you want to go into business, uh, you, the only way I'll say yes is with a partner. You got to have a partner because I know you struggle with balance. And she's right. Like I, I, wow, I would have just been spinning in a circle, you know. Um, so mm -hmm. having the balance of a partner, even if it was just to slow me down and provide a gut check, you know, uh, Richard and I have learned over the years to value each other's skills and probably me more learning to stay out of his way and let him literally have last say, especially in EOS. Like he's the integrator. He's the COO. Yes. If he says no, it's a no. He's accountable for that. And, and um, so I can make suggestions and recommendations within the context of the existing business. But if the leadership team says no, that's it. And that's a great accountability. That really is. And I love that advice from your wife in the lesson there is that a partnership is valuable when you, you pointed out the importance of having shared values and purpose and, and really vision. And I think those things can change. But if you have shared purpose and shared values, you can navigate a change in vision long term. Yeah. And I think at the end of the day, especially when financials are intertwined, right? And future success and future financials, it's, it's putting the relationship first before any single dollar. And when you have that relationship and understanding, it, partnerships are, are a wonderful thing. The second you start letting getting money, greed, ego get in the way of the partnership and the well-being of each other, that's when you're going down the wrong. Path. That's really well said. Yeah, the relationship comes first. And, you know, listen, um, I'm 62. I've been at it since 94. A lot of people have worked for us and with us. Um, and I appreciate all those people. But, you know, ultimately leadership 
and ownership is visible and vulnerable. Um, and that's true in any context. And so, you know, they know all your warts and blemishes and failures and all your successes and goodness. And um, 100%. Yeah. So it's, it's a great privilege to lead it. But when we started, you know, it was just like, let's go. Hey, who needs anything more than an $11,000 backlog? We didn't even know what a backlog was, you know? <laughs> I didn't know what a backlog is. It, so, so how big are you today? Uh, like people, I guess we could start there. Headcount right now, I think we're, I, I don't actually have the number. We're 20-ish, 20 20-something, 20, 20 people. Yeah, that's tremendous. Um, and, and what year, we, we're talking about the entrepreneur operating system, EOS, yeah. which is the book Traction for those that don't know. Could you tell us more about that and what went into the decision? Like, What was... Let's say what frustrated you about the business or what opportunity did you, did you see going forward that made you take the leap and implement EOS? Yeah, good question. So we went years ago with E-Myth Revisited Michael Gerber. Great, Love e great plan. Have you read E-Myth? Uh, it was one of the, I, I read two books back in 2014. I made the decision to go run my father's business and, and start to go for the new engineering business instead of an MBA. And I said, I'm going to go try to run a business and I'm going to try to learn an MBA through audiobooks. E-Myth in the, um, what was it? The, I'm drawing a blank on Darren Hardy's book. Back yeah, then. I know. I know what um, you mean. Those were the two, the compound effect. Those were the two books that like launched me on this lifelong learning. Great journey, books. And I couldn't speak. Darren Hardy, man. That guy is one serious, intense dude. He is I'll have intense. to talk to you about that. My, my personal coach has me on this deletion concept from Darren right now. Like, He's ruthless. He's like, and I'll get back to your question. He's like, I don't eat yes. things with flour. I don't eat things with sugar. I don't drink salt. I don't care. I'm sorry if it's your birthday. I'm not eating your cake. I, you know, I do this thing. I don't do all these other things. I'm like, okay, he's an intense student, but he stands he's by what he says. Committed, what? Right? There's that thing. I, I don't negotiate with myself. I, I make a decision and that's final and I never consider it. Again. Right. Exactly. So anyway, back on your question. Um, I think the E-Myth and E-Myth Revisited concept of organizational chart and role development is is really good. And that served us well for a long time. I mean, it, we were 43, 44 people at one point. But the frustration we ran into was, you know, people say this all the time, but it was really real for us. We could not crack through a certain revenue ceiling. We just couldn't. We did one time at that $5 million mark. It was like, we just we just capped out like there was this glass ceiling and really what it came down to was uh, and the jury's still out because there's been so many changes through COVID and there's so much I could run. But but the executive summary is. We couldn't get any traction. We had lost some people. The business was a little unwieldy. Um, and I think a lot of it was me not providing an, as enough clarity on expectation. We didn't have scorecards. We didn't have any of that. It was very entrepreneurial um, to the exclusion of the management discipline. And um, mm -hmm. my personal coach, Chuck Misha, introduced me to the book Rocket Fuel, um, which is one of the EOS books by uh, Gino and Richard and I read it. We took the test and he's like 80% integrator and like 80% visionary. He's Because he said, I yeah. think this would be a really good way for you to go. I'm coaching two other companies that use this. So anyway, long story longer, um, we met then with a guy named David Howard, who is a guy we really respect. And he was the integ integrator for Keystone Technology Consultants. They were our technology firm for a while. And he's an EOS implementer as well. And so he decided he decided to launch us on this journey. We met with our some significant people here, and they said, yeah, this sounds good. So we started it. I would say we started looking at it in June of 2021. We really implemented it in early September on the leadership team piece in like September of that year. And then we did our first um, annual meeting in, with a vision traction organizer in December, January of last year. And then this was, Great. so we completed one full year. 
So one full year. And, and what was the team's reaction? Were they excited for the new journey? Were they resistant to change? The, what? They realized something new had to happen and something new could be good. Now, in the meantime, we retracted in size significantly. I think that was partly COVID, partly culture change, a variety of dynamics that would be a book in length. But um, I think we were excited about it. Whether we whether it took us too much time for, to provide enough clarity or not, or get traction in our roles or not, I think some of the staff were less excited about it. You know, we've had some folks here a long time that, that have really stayed committed to us and others that in that transition, they left. And, and I think some of that's natural, like, you know, okay, if the partners are one of your hiring managers and now they're saying for the sake of the long-term sustainability of the business, we got to rebuild this thing on the fly you're going to report to somebody else. They may not like that. Yeah. I think that's okay though. Like if anything, not every company is for every person, right? Like again, aligned purpose values, like where you're trying to head. If I, if I compare that to our company, we transitioned to open book financial management. We love that. I wouldn't consider running a business any other way, but that is not for every person. Some people don't want to have the scrutiny or the awareness or the stress of seeing financials. True. So like that, I, I know we, we lost at least one, we lost one person throughout that time. And we, we were suspicious that it's probably because of that, right? It, it was just heading in the wrong direction for something that they wanted to be a part of. Yeah. And you know, okay. whatever, whatever, a pers whatever context a person hires into an organization by, when the organization makes a shift that changes that context from a reporting point of view, you know, we owe it to those people to tell them what's happening and why. And I think that's not done great on a good day. Um, we do the best we can. And, it, you know, they, they may say, I'll give it a shot. And they may say, nah. And, and they're never going to tell you typically. They're just mm -hmm. going to leave at some point. And it's inevitable. When you, when you install a new business operating system or you go in a different direction, you are going to experience turnover I don't care who you are. You're going to experience turnover. Yeah. That cha change is not easy, no. but change is necessary if you want to stay at the top of your game and continue to advance the company. So one year in, we ran EOS. We went through the change obstacles. You're a year in. You're going to keep it for year two. Were you happy with the results? What improvements did you see from implementing EOS? I'm happy with the results, the increasing um, I have a board of advisors, and one of them said to me in October-ish, maybe it was August, September, he said, I sent him an update to our Vision Traction organizer with our, after a quarterly review, and he said, John, it appears to me from the outside that you're starting to get traction. Would you say that's the case? And I said, that's interesting. I said, yeah, I would. It hasn't fully manifested yet in you know, all the metrics. But I, I said, I think that's fair. So uh, it takes more time. It, it, it takes time. And it's more expensive than you would think it is. It, it, maybe not from a visible cost, but just the labor investment. It takes time. And, you know, we, we just did this um, critical review. The leadership team did this review. And, and one of the questions was, there's there's two things you do. One is you say tell, tell say something about that person directly that you think they do really well at and affirm them. And then say something to them that you wish they would stop or start doing. And one of the things that uh, one of the leadership team members said to me was they wished I would stop minimizing the time element on the path to success as an organization. And I said, you know what, that's a fair comment because from an entrepreneurial point of view, I'm like, come on, let's roll, let's go, let's put the pedal down. We can do this. This is easy. Best sell it. Go deliver it. He's like, yeah. you know, I get it. That's your mentality, but but it it's not that simple. And I and what I heard him saying was if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go long, go together. That's somebody else's quote, right? But that is that's the truth. Quote. It is the truth. And, and to your point, like it is still like 
as a business leader, the responsibility to cast the vision of where we're heading. Right. And, but be a lot of, another quote is like, we overestimate what we can accomplish in one year, but we underestimate what we can accomplish in five. Totally. And that strategic process, you talk about the vision traction organizer, these, these meetings processes like the EOS, they, they stimulate this conversation company wide. And, and that to me is what creates alignment. That's like so powerful for an organization. That, that's the biggest thing, uh, Renz, is that I, we're better managed managerially. We're better managed under my partner and a leadership team than me trying to live both the visionary and operator life. It's not. And so what it, that, that what same thing proves true for me. Is it, That's a hundred percent. Yeah. House. What I like is it puts each person in their best, the best area of their unique ability to provide the most value to the clients and the most value to the company and just stay out of each other's way. And that L10 meeting brings us all together and, and we solve things. And, and the thing I like about it is, you know exactly what to expect from a meeting. You can jump into any meeting and facilitate it and you get things done. And I'm reminding us all the time, hey guy, hey, remember, we gotta be talking about the right things and we gotta get things done. Meeting, I just mm -hmm. posted about this in LinkedIn. Meeting for the sake of meeting is a waste of time. But if you think, oh, we don't want to do meetings anymore. Go ahead and think that. That means you just don't know how to do meetings. But if you know how to do meetings and get things done, it's it's a lever to really accelerate. And that's what EOS helps with. Yeah. And, and so for the audience that's not familiar with EOS, you can learn more about this through the book, which is Traction. I listened to it on audiobook. A level, an L10 is a level 10 meeting. And really it's a, it's a meeting agenda that we can fill in and make sure that we, one, have a timestamp to each part of the agenda. And then two, we're identifying the things that actually move the needle. We're not talking about the hottest topic or the side story. They, they, traction calls them or EOS refer to them as rocks. They're the, like, what are the boulders we got to get out of the way? That's the obstacle of getting to where we want to be and make sure that we're talking about the rocks. I, I personally love that that uh that label <laughs> removing rocks is so yeah and if label. people want to look up the rocks it's from steve covey stephen covey's you know analogy where you know you don't put the water in the sand and the marbles in the jar first you put the rocks in the jar first and uh, it looks like it's filled up but it's not now you start putting in gravel and it's still not filled up put in the sand it's still put it you know so you major yep. on the majors first absolutely absolutely and I wanted to make sure we, we're talking for a long time, but I want to give us time to get into your podcast. So people that want to learn more, hear more about your point of view and, and learn from your guests, creating structure. When did you launch it? What made you so interested in getting a podcast going? Love to hear more about it. <laughs> well, um, you know, why a podcast? Uh, I like to talk. So I'm, yeah. Yeah. You're good at well, it. Well, that, that's part of it. But um, I had been wanting to do a podcast for a while. I was a big podcast listener to a lot of podcasts on YouTube. And I thought it's just something that drew me to it. Um, the big hurdle for me, of all things, it, it wasn't the, the visible nature of it. It was the technical side. How do I do it? My son, who has an audio technician training background, he was actually like, listen, I'll, he, he's, he's not working for me now, but he, he, he was equally responsible for all of the stuff, not visible. Joshua, he's, he's like, mm -hmm. here's Buzzsprout. I'll show you how to get this set up. Here's the, I said, you spec the equipment, you give me the cost, you show me how to functionally do it. And I'll do it. And if it weren't for him, I wouldn't have started. So I have to give him credit. Um, I, you know, until we came up with a core purpose through EOS of enabling facades that inspire, which is our new core purpose, it always has been, but it wasn't identified. My, our core purpose, our brand slogan was creating structure. And that's a service mark. And I, and I like it because it's a play on words and it says, how do you physically create structure in the world, like visible structure we drive over or live in? But then how do you bring and create structure to your life and to your business? And um, so I, I wanted to stick with that creating structure. It's a great name. Yeah, thank you. Name. I always joked if I'd been a transportation engineer, it probably would have been bridging gaps, you know. 
<laughs> That's a good mind the gap. Mind the gap. Right. But um, so I kept the creating structure and yeah, I, I wanted to do it primarily because um, I was interested in it. And as it turns out, um, I enjoy it. I think I've got good feedback from the guests. They feel well cared for. Um, it gives people an opportunity to bring a voice um, that they sometimes don't know they have. And it gives me energy. Um, and uh, I think it brings energy to other areas of the business too. That's great. And I, I was thankful you had me on there as a guest. I thought you did a great job uh, throughout the interview and kept the conversation going in a helpful way. And uh, hopefully I'm learning from people like you and, and, and making this as valuable as possible for the audience. Um, have you seen a change or, or how have you grown, let's say personally or professionally? Like what, what has been the intangible results of, of starting this podcast? Yeah, I actually um, was thinking about that. Um, it, there's been some really interesting results from it. Yeah. I've taken a break since September and I'm starting up now. I have a new production company actually behind me. So it is coming back. I've got some great guests lined up. Um, That's great. And so look for more, but you know, I have gotten personal, for instance, I interviewed two, I, I interviewed on one podcast, I interviewed some gentlemen and I got a thank you note from his retired father who I, I had no idea who he was. I, I got a thank you note from him saying, I just want to thank you for putting my son on your podcast. I never exactly understood what he did, no matter how much he explained it to me until I heard him say it on your podcast. So thank you. I, um, I got at least one other person. Um, Amazing, by the way. I love One that. other person started a podcast partly because of me and I think two other people. I've had a few people send me thank you notes saying it was exactly what they were looking for and they listen to it every time and they really appreciate the content. And, you know, if one person is positively affected, it's it's worth it to me. So that's a collateral issue. That. But uh, as I say to some of the people I work with or coach, it's always about the other. It's always about the value to the community. It's always about providing content that will help edify and inspire people or bring them more knowledge. And it's very gratifying that way. Love that. Yeah. It's about shared, shared knowledge, shared learning. We can all grow and learn from each other's perspectives, our experiences. And because of that, we can evolve and move forward faster. Amen. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, uh, John, thank you so much for coming today. I'm going to, I'm going to close out here with a, with a few questions. Um, one, we're going to dive back into the building envelope world just a little bit. There is this newfound emphasis in growing requirements for sustainable design and construction and reducing our carbon footprint. One of the ways to reduce our comp, uh, our carbon footprint is to make sure that we're reusing and revitalizing the existing buildings that we have today. We have far more existing buildings than we are building new every year. So over the next 10 years, as we have this like really important date, uh, I think it's 2030 of reducing our carbon consumption uh, or creation by 2030. How is that changing your job and how is that changing the demand on building envelopes? One, with new, but two, what do you kind of foresee coming with existing buildings? It's going to be really hard and taxing to update that existing building envelopes. So. Yeah, so two things. Uh, first thing is, frankly, I'm not seeing it change much in the area of when I look at glazed aluminum multi-story buildings, not much has impacted us that way in on the sustainability side from carbon footprint and recycle, although a lot of that stuff is happening at the manufacturer level. You know, aluminum has a lot of recycled content, which is good. But the biggest area that has changed by far is the whole thermal, thermal capability, thermal, thermal performance of the, the facade and meeting specific U-value targets. Um, minimizing condensation issues, thermal thermal um, uh, separation. Um, so that that has definitely changed. I've seen a couple of mass timber jobs actually. Where now we're having to anchor curtain wall anchors that are taking 
three or four kips, which isn't much to you, but that's a typical curtain wall load, uh, you know, to a yep. big piece of wood that has to have a lag bolt or a through bolt or some kind of metal thing put on it. So those connections get odd. That's they for do. Sure. And then from an existing building stock, it's really big Renz. Um, you know, um, Paul Greasy, who was our director of building envelope consultant, he left here to go work, for instance, for a company that has a reglaze, a reclad um, procedure that that helps bring buildings in New York up to current energy code. And, Very you know, we were working with a client the other day saying, well, if you think you need to replace your roof on the re recommendation of a roofing contractor, my consultant was like, remember, you got to bring it up to current energy code. That's going to change more than just the roof. You're going to have to do a building energy analysis now, whereas opposed to just repairing or over roofing that it might be a different story. Uh, the trillions of dollars, trillions of dollars of building stock, to your point, all have to be maintained or knocked down. And so they're being brought up to energy code, better insulation, better glass, um, reclad. So we're seeing more and more and more acknowledgement of not just sustainability, but building performance overall from owners and developers. What I'm hearing in this conversation and some of my intuition as I think about real estate development and the future real estate value and what's coming of these these new energy demands and like you said, thermal bridging and building envelope performance of existing buildings. It's going to change the future value of a building and, and having someone like you in a corner when you're assessing buying a new property or developing a new building with insight into future like almost certain demands that are coming, you can make better decisions today that cost a dollar that might cost you 10 or $20 in two to three years. So one, it's, it's a, you can reduce the risk significantly in your new development, but really buying an existing building or identifying risk in your current building so that you can plan and build your pro forma and your capital and your debt so that you can manage that storm later on. Totally. Yeah. Um, that's totally true. Um, there's in the major cities in particular, there's always reglazing and, and waterproof repairs going on. But in again, in many of them, you know, you're looking at a building from 1945 or 1970 and you, you've got to do something to reduce energy consumption and bring that exterior envelope up up to, to snuff to current current standards. All right. Thank you. And uh, what is the top book or podcast you'd recommend? My favorite book for 2022 was The Boys in the Boat, which is about a crewing team from the University of Washington in the 1936 Olympics. The, the protagonist, the hero in that book, Joe, the, the difficulty that he overcame in his life is just, you know, make you think um, – Hard times create some really amazing results in some people, and he was one of those people. But it's just a, a book about, you know, post-depression era, journeyman. A lot of people listening probably have read the book, but The Boys in the Boat, I highly recommend it. Boys in the Boat. All right. Thank you for that. And, and for the emerging leaders out there that are tuned in, what's the best advice you have for them? I'm actually going to read something on this. Emerging Leaders. I'm saying invest in yourself and your field, get coaching formally or informally, learn soft skills, know that soft is hard and hard is soft, as they say, develop empathy and people skills, but be clear, be candid while being servant oriented. Leading is a privilege and a responsibility at the same time. Take it seriously, push ego aside and down as far as you can. Ultimately, leadership is vulnerable and visible, so be wise develop wisdom and um, know that it is a journey. Phenomenal advice. I know you're a great leader and I, I think that's the perfect way to close. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you for your time today, John. I wish you nothing but the best in the future. Absolutely. My privilege and pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Everyone can't thank you enough for tuning in today. I hope you got a ton out of today's conversation. And if you could do us one favor, if you did get value, please like, share, and comment. Subscribe on whatever channel you're tuning in on. 
please leave a review. It helps us expand and grow and support more people. That's the end goal. We want to bring the insights of these amazing guests to as many people as possible. Thank you.